The Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is The Blockchain Show. Happy holidays to you and a very happy new year. I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody who has listened to us in the past year and in previous years, to all of our guests, co-hosts, present and absent. I'm very grateful for each and every one of you. The goal of this podcast was to demystify and promote the widespread use of cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Sometimes it's been easier than others, but I feel like the mission is still the same. And as the world gets used to hearing more and more about Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum, dApps, all that good stuff, I think it's important to try to bring new people in, try to explain things to them so that they can eventually help others. Yeah, it's changed a lot in the last few years, but uh, I, th I feel like it's not too late for us to have an impact. I wanted to read a quote from Frederick Hayek. He said, We can't have a good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. That is, we can't take it violently out of their hands. All we can do is by some sly roundabout way introduce something they can't stop. So he did a lot of writing 75 to 80 years ago. I remember a few podcasts back, I was asking if a government like China could stop the blockchain. Technically, it's possible, but highly improbable was the answer. And since then, we've seen China come out about two months ago saying that they should be the world leader in blockchain and asking their banking and financial institutions to embrace blockchain. It's amazing. And you know, I don't expect that's going to happen in the United States anytime soon, but imagine if we all got behind it. And not just rich corporations, heads of state, but if governments could in some way shut down all of the major mining farms across the world, I would imagine that the core people behind a lot of these blockchains would just mine on their own personal computers, and that would be a lot harder to stop. Probably more mining pools would come out of it. People would be incentivized to mine. It's hard to think about in, in a Western country, but in places like Hong Kong, banks are seizing people's money who are labeled as terrorists. That's actually happening right now. Who decides what a terrorist is, is, is something that I've been thinking about over the last 10 years or so. Anyways, in a way it would kind of add more security to the network uh, by replacing all these big mining farms that would hypothetically get shut down. I mean, it would actually keep the network alive. Um, I do think if all that were to happen, you know, the kind of vulnerabilities that the network might be exposed to if, if the hypothetical were to happen, uh, the tech is designed to be strong, to repel this sort of thing. And I could be wrong, but, you know, my understanding is that as long as one computer somewhere is mining, the network should persist and the transactions will continue to process. You hear Andreas Antonopoulos talk about unstoppable code. It really kind of is. And it's it's been really interesting this last year talking to different startups and different, just seeing the challenges that they have to go through, just not so much in the legalities, but just in the technical side, trying to scale it up. It's all kind of, I don't want to say basic, but it's got a beautiful simplicity to it as a whole. When you read the the Bitcoin white paper. It's It just kind of makes sense. It's like, yeah, why isn't this taking so long? And, and I don't want to get conspiratorial, but obviously it's a very disruptive technology. 
there's a lot of groups out there that for years have tried to downplay blockchain, thinking about banks, thinking about, you know, credit card companies, uh, big financial companies like Stripe, PayPal, Apple Pay. You know, they're each trying to do their own thing. They don't want to compete. I think it all comes down to control, really. I'm all for capitalism, but it's got to be in the benefit of the people. And I think that has not been the case so much lately. Anyways, I want to leave you guys with a clip. Something I thought was pretty interesting. Bill Gates explaining the internet in 1995. This is, of course, for educational purposes. What this internet thing? Do you, do you know anything about that? Sure. <laughs> what, what the hell is that exactly? Well, it's, it's become a place where people are publishing information. Right. So you, everybody can have their own homepage. Companies are there, the latest information. It's wild what's going on. You can send electronic mail to people. Uh, it is the big new thing. Yeah, but you know, uh, it's easy to criticize something you don't fully understand, which is my position here. Go ahead. But I, I can remember a couple of months ago, there was like a big breakthrough announcement <laughs> that on the Internet or on some computer deal, they were going to broadcast a, a baseball game. You could listen to a baseball game on your computer. And I just thought to myself, does radio ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I just... There's, there's a difference. There is a difference. It's not a huge difference. What is the uh, difference? But you can you can listen to the baseball game whenever you want. All right. Too. Yeah, I love that. I was trying to explain podcasting to my father-in-law, who's almost 80 years old, and I, I basically I just said it's kind of like radio, but whenever you want to listen, and anything you want to listen to. Because he's really into like audiobooks and history and that sort of thing. Um, I'd actually like to have him back on the podcast sometime because he's been very successful with traditional markets and investing. And a few years back, he just did not care whatsoever about Bitcoin or podcasts for that matter. And it seems like the more and more it's written about in newspapers and talked about on the news programs, people kind of come around. And I remember when I was talking with Mark and Ian, uh, man, almost two years ago, the first time they were on the show, uh, they later went on to co-host for like over a year. I miss those guys. Um, I wonder what they're doing. I need to get in contact with them. It's kind of, time's been marching on here. But, um, I asked them, I said, what's it going to take for mass adoption? How are people going to come to terms with the next wave of tech? You know, like the new, what's the, you know, like the new internet. This is like internet 3.0. And they basically said, it's going to be in movies more. It's going to be on TV. It's going to be in people's Facebook feeds, that sort of thing. And I kind of, at first I thought, well, yeah, I guess so. But it's it just seems so it's so weird when you think about people, they it's almost like programming a computer. And, I, and bear with me, because this is gonna get kind of weird. If you've seen the show Westworld, it, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. But my own thought of the matter was, you know, can you code a person? Like you can code a computer. And a person has a lot of times like a moral code. A lot of us have heard of that. And obviously computer runs on code. Something weird to me is growing up, I used to hear commercials saying, you know, stay tuned for your local programming or your regular programming. And that term kind of struck me. Like, why are they saying programming? I'm, I'm not a computer. But come to think about it, if you get kids at a young age watching a bunch of advertisements and getting them tied into this, system of doing things it kind of makes sense that you can essentially code a person so introducing concepts like the blockchain bitcoin some of the other buzzwords here and there throughout news programs you know newspapers it gets it in people's consciousness maybe in their subconscious so when obviously a lot of people are not going to listen to a podcast about the blockchain 
mean, there's a lot of you listening, but it's not like millions of people. Whenever people start talking about it face to face, suddenly it's not just, oh, I've heard of Bitcoin. It's more like, yeah, well, this is what it's being used for. This is what it could be used for. And then, uh, you know, here in LA, I'm starting to see billboards. I'm starting to see ads on buses even. It's crazy. But yeah, uh, I didn't mean to go on this long. I just wanted to do a short little thank you to everybody. We are filling up the calendar for next year. So if you know someone who would like to be a guest on the show, we're looking for blockchain experts. We're looking for tech startups who are utilizing the blockchain. Uh, we're just trying to continue the mission to demystify blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Cryptocurrencies are cool too, so we like to talk about that. We're not so much into treating them like stocks. I mean, I know that some people are really into that, but we're more about how can this technology change people's lives. It's been fun. I look forward to getting the co-host back on, and I know things kind of slowed down for the holiday season, but we're still here and grateful that you are too. And I hope that you all had a very Merry Christmas or whatever holiday that you celebrate. Happy New Year. Cheers. Thank you.